Well, hey, thanks for joining us for Worship Online here at Desert Springs. And as always, you can share your prayer requests with us. Just reach out using our contact information here at the bottom of the main page at visitdsc.org. And I want to say thank you, too, for your faithful support in giving. Just click that blue Give button here on our main page. Finally, God bless you as you follow the Lord. And now let's join worship as it's already begun. There's a, house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, a beautiful thing to be a child of God. Amen. 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 This church has been uh, a rock for me. I have felt um, encouragement. I have felt love. I have felt support. I've been at this church for 19 years. And it's the longest I've ever been at any church, any one church. And um, I happened to be at the Blake Shelton concert a uh, week, week or so ago. And um, there was a young lady that opened up the, the concert with a song that just blew me away. Um, and I immediately knew that I needed to sing that song to express to all of you how much this church means to me. Okay. <clears throat> Can't help but wonder if these floorboards creaked the same in 42 when my great grandpa poured his heart and soul into preaching the good news. And these tattered old red hymn books have caught a tear or two. Cause it's hard to sing just as I am without the spirit moving you. If those altars at the front could testify, I know they'd say It never once got old hearing a sinner call his name Another stained glass never saved a soul And these pews ain't on the roll that's called up yonder I know the pulpit's just a wooden stand but it's felt the power of God's hand as His glory filled the place with awe and wonder. I know it's just a building, plain and simple white. But it's the building where Jesus changed my life. And I know the claim to be the biggest nobody ever called it cool but it's where my mama and my daddy met at vacation bible school it's been the picture perfect dream of a thousand glowing brides it's heard the weeping as a loved one's laid to rest with sad goodbyes i know the stained glass never saved a soul and these pews ain't on the roll that's called up yonder i know the pulpit's just a wooden stand but it's felt the power of god's hand as his glory filled the place with awe and wonder i know it's just a building plain and simple white but it's the building where jesus changed my life it's where i learned that jesus hears my prayers and he's walking with me everywhere and no matter what i I know it won't stand here forever, 
but I should miss it when it's gone. And I'll be forever grateful to call this church my home. I know the stained glass never saved a soul, and these pews ain't on the roll that's called up yonder. I know the pulpit's just a wooden stand, but it's felt the power of God's hand as this glory fills the place with awe and wonder. I know it's just a building, plain and simple white, but it's the building where Jesus changed my life. And it's the building where Jesus changed my life. Amen. 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 Amen, Terry. It's a special day for Terry. Uh, this is her last Sunday here. She's moving to be near family, or her son, and, uh, and uh, closer to her daughter and her grandbaby and son-in-law. And uh, we have a couple of presentations this morning to make. And uh, Terry, would you can just come stand here right in the center of us all? And I'm going to move this over. And uh, Dean and Catherine Gatons are here representing choir this morning, and uh, we'll get you a mic. And uh, it's, a, it's a special morning for two of our ladies who have been real involved in ministry here at the church and also uh, with music ministry. Terry, we're going to miss you dearly, and uh, thank you for that beautiful song. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> you. And uh, on behalf of the church family, for all of your years of service, not only as a soloist and part of worship choir and now conducting choir and, uh, and all you've done, we just have a little plaque for you uh, with deep appreciation for time well spent presented to Terry Griffin Worship Choir Ministries. That's for you from all of us. Thank you. We got a little uh, card and love gift from the church. And uh, Dean and Catherine have a little presentation for you from Worship Choir. We do. Yeah, well, it's not easy to say goodbye, but it's just to see you later, right? So we know she'll be back, and she'll be back visiting, but we just um, have appreciated. Uh, we've been in choir with you for 17, 17 years. years. She's been here 19, so just a little bit less than that, singing together, and we so appreciate you, and we speak for all the choir of saying thank you for all of your years of service, 10 years as choir director, and so it's hard to believe it's been that long, but... Such a blessing, but she's been such a blessing to all of us. And so um, I brought her some fresh flowers from my garden, and some. And, uh, Lila brought her these flowers, and we have a card from everyone signed and uh, a wonderful Amazon gift card as a present from the choir to you. So hopefully it will keep her going as she goes to Vegas and settles over there uh, near her son. And uh, do you want to say something, Terry? Me too. So uh, I... Beautiful song she just shared, correct? And it was only appropriate when she sang about the pews. And those of you that were here, remember we had these beautiful baby blue pews in here for year, years. And she sat, and if I can give you right, thank you, dear. Right about where Miss um, Lorraine is sitting right now, 10 years ago, and when our previous director, the Lord had pulled him to another uh, church, uh, Terry sat there and She's a little emotional, as you can see today, and she says, I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand. <laughs> and, but the Lord knew. So Jeremiah 29, 11, help me out, folks, for the, I know the plans I have for you. For you. So she sat right there, and I said, you know, Terry, there's a plan. And that plan, I mean, think about it, folks, is that I, he speaking, the plans I have for you and big old me. And so we sit there and we say, Lord, what is planned? So, at Terry, again, I'm on behalf of choir and on behalf of Desert Springs, for we've been here 17 years, you for 19, uh, the way that you have brought life. 
to us on Monday nights has been a fun Monday and Tuesdays. We went back and forth. But in serving the Lord with you has been remarkable. Um, we spoke down here uh, before service began, and it was, she's excited, but a little concerned of what lies ahead. But I said, Terry, the excitement of that church that you're going to, that you're going to be able to serve and sing like this and or a different choir. But with that said, questions have been, will the Desert Springs Choir continue? Yes, yes, it will. And Terry, we spoke about that. And that's what the joy of the Lord is to say that we're going to continue. So those of us, Catherine and I grew up uh, in church choirs. And who, who else grew up in a church choir at least saying over, look at all those beautiful hands. Don't forget, folks, when you're raising your hands, October, we will reconvene. And the Lord is working those final plans out for a church choir here. So be praying about that. If there's any questions, you please come to us. But again, Terry, on behalf of choir, we're so grateful for the time that we had with you and the stories that you've shared that have made us laugh, giggle, and cry in knowing that you've given everything to this to us. And we're very, very grateful. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for Terry. Oh, we love you, Terry. Oh, amen. And uh, we have another wonderful lady who's coming now. And uh, I'm going to hand the mic to Pastor Lorraine. And uh, I'm going to invite Debbie Griffin. Would you please come to the platform? Uh, you know, every time you see the kids sing up here on the platform, every time we have at Christmas time a children's musical, that's all Debbie Griffin. And Debbie's coming to join us this morning. And uh, Debbie and her husband Griff are staying at the church. You're not moving away, and um, you're not allowed to move away. But, but uh, I, I can't say that, but you know what I mean. But um, uh, I'll tell you, but uh, we just thank God for your years of service here, Debbie. And Lorraine's going to share our presentation. Yeah. Um, if anybody knows Debbie and you've ever had any contact with her, you'll receive emails from her with this verse on it. It says Matthew 19:26. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This is a lady who can make the impossible happen with God's strength and power. She gives them all the glory and all the credit. She's a very thankful lady. I'm always um, wonderful that she always thanks everybody when they serve in her ministry. And... Um, she was able to make it snow in the desert at Christmas time. Um, I remember that. During COVID, we had to move our whole Christmas musical, create a stage, and um, have it out on the back patio. But she made that happen too. Uh, she's been our kids' choir director for five years. I don't think people know uh, and understand what that all entails. Uh, she. Um, also uh, directs our Easter Interactive Experience. She um, uh, does, directs our VBS skits and even the VBS uh, girl dancers. And even for the past three years, she has ran our three and under department. So I'm so grateful for her and we're gonna miss her. Um, she is now working at Eisenhower as a spiritual advisor. She's kind of in charge of all the chaplains there and tells all the people where to go. And so that's really, really exciting. Kids choir will go on. Thankfully, God has provided. And so we're, we're grateful for that. I'm thankful for all the skills she taught the kids. You know, to get kids to come on a stage really takes uh, courage. And she always trained the kids that, you know what, this is your opportunity to serve the congregation. You're bringing great joy through singing and dancing and acting. And um, I have no greater joy than, I mean, we would see kids do miracles or kids who are extremely shy be able to sing, you know, and we would just look at each other and go like this. So it, it was really a joy working alongside Debbie. But I really want people to know that she does things with excellence. And so I really appreciated all her excellence and I appreciated her patience and her perseverance. So Debbie, I'm gonna greatly miss you. And so are all the kids. And at 11 o'clock, all the kids will be here, but I just couldn't make them come for three services. It's just too much. <laughs> we love you, Debbie. Yes, yes you could, Debbie. And um, just a couple of words. Um, this lady right here, none of this would be possible, obviously, without her and without the leadership of the church. And I, probably not too many of the parents are in this service because they are still getting their kids out of bed. Um, but without the kids' parents getting them here and encouraging them and keeping them coming, none of it would have been possible either. But I am a firm believer in the importance of music, drama, theater, for kids to learn it. Um, it's not an optional thing. It 
provide so much depth to their personalities and to their spiritual life. And to be able to do it in a church is even 10 times better than obviously doing it at a school because they're doing it for a completely different reason and they know it and they're learning it and I just couldn't have been more blessed to be with those kids. I'm gonna miss them a lot, <laughs> but new time, new life, moving on to some other things and I appreciate that as well. And God drops things into my lap and um, this thing at the hospital is just amazing. Best job I've ever had, and it's 70 years old. That's a pretty amazing thing to say. So, Amen, Debbie. And we, um, we'd like to present to you on behalf of the whole church family with deep appreciation for your time well spent presented to Debbie Griffin. And we love you, so Debbie. For you, a little love gift from the church. We love you, Debbie. Thank we you. love you. you. Oh. I'm not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Let's give her another big praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Lorraine. And uh, uh, what, a, what a blessing, what a joy. It's, it's bittersweet. We're so happy for them both and how God's guiding them. And it just reminds me that all life's a season. We trust God's blessing your season, whatever season you're in right now. And um, I always say in whatever season of life, uh, receive all the good you can. And then from the challenging things, uh, receive all the learning you can from the Lord of what God's uh, seeking to speak into your life and teach you so that you can more effectively minister to others as God releases you from that seasonal time of learning. A couple of important things uh, before we take offering. First, uh, you can help send children and youth to summer camp. There's a big um, a display up in the center of the lobby. You won't be able to miss it. You'll run into it. And uh, you, can, you can give at any level to help uh, send children and youth to summer camp. As you can appreciate, I think it's about $80 for a cheeseburger now, something like that. So um, that's without pickles. And uh, so, uh, you know, summer camp is not cheap. And so it really helped your sponsorship helps to bring cost of camp down to a more reasonable level for parents to be able to pay uh, the remaining balance. Uh, to send their children off to a life-changing experience at Forest Home here in the San Bernardino Mountains. Then, we're also doing something that is irregardless of political party today. We have an opportunity here in California to sign an initiative, and it's uh, at the nice little wooden bar area. Can I say bar in church? I don't know, but I just said it. It's in the lobby, and you can sign the initiative uh, to help protect children and parents' rights in the school system. What I mean by that is the right for parents to be involved in the decisions of their children for sexuality, the importance of uh, parents being notified when children are having mental health issues, and the importance of uh, protecting uh, the welfare of our kids. So I invite you to uh, uh, go into the lobby after service, again at the Wooden Bar area uh, in the lobby, and to sign that initiative, I'll be signing it and uh, just trusting God's best for our children. Jesus said that if uh, you lead one of these little ones astray, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea. So we want to protect our children. I know you'll agree. So thank you for considering signing that. With that, we'd like to invite our host to come forward. And if you'd bow with me, we'll pray for offering. So Heavenly Father, thank you for all you do for us today. We pray you would protect our kids and our young people, Lord, uh, wherever they are uh, here in the valley, and uh, that you'd bless them and encourage them and help them to grow up well in you. We thank you today for uh, Debbie Griffin and her ministry here, for Terry Griffin and her ministry here. And God, we pray your blessing on them with this new season of life you're ushering them both into. Lord, for all of us in our seasons, Help us to receive all the good you have for us and to learn all you want to speak into our lives. And Lord, today we pray you'd bless this offering. Use it for your glory, for Christ's sake. Amen. Welcome to Desert Springs Church. We're so glad you've joined us. If this is your first day at Desert Springs Church, please stop by our Connecting Place counter. We have a gift for you and want to thank you for coming. What's your name? Alex. My name is Kai. It's Emily. Christian. My name is Alondra. 
And how long have you been a student at Desert Springs Church? I've been a student for like a year and a half. Uh, I've been a student at Desert Springs Church for about five years. I've been a student at Desert Springs Church for about three years now. For five years. For five months at Desert Springs. And how many times have you gone to Forest Home? I've gone to Forest Home nine times. Six times. Uh, I've been to Forest Home for like four times now. I've been to Forest Home one time. I've been to Forest Home about five times. If you could describe Forest Home in one word, what would it be? I would describe Forest Home life changing. It's powerful. Is it refresh? Refreshing? I'd say changing. I would describe Forest Home as rejoicing. What, what's one of your favorite things to do at Forest Home? Probably solo time. What is solo time? So the time is when you have a set apart time with God and how you really get to connect with Him. One of my favorite things to do is they have early morning worship. But my favorite thing is free time. Cabin time, yeah, you get all your buddies in your own cabin, you know, and you get to ask these questions that, you know, others also have. And it creates like this bond with each other that just makes it a whole different thing. My favorite thing to do at Forest Home would probably have to be polar bearing. What is polar bearing? So polar bearing is essentially where our church or even friends go down to the river at night and we stick our heads or full body into the freezing cold river for as long as possible. It's really fun. I'll take your word for it. How has Forest Home helped you grow your relationship with God? Forest Home has helped me sort of recenter my faith. It's helped me through like worship, strengthening my faith, especially when we have a long time. I get to answer questions, read the Bible, and just look more into it. It's helped me grow my faith and my relationship with God. I didn't think that I would have this fire for God. I'd say Forest Home is what you know ignited my faith, uh, really brought me closer to God. You know, I started to take things more seriously afterwards. There's one night at Forest Home and it's the last day we go to a bunch of stations and each station is different on how we interact with god he is there and he's always going to be there would you recommend forest home to a friend i would definitely recommend forest home i feel like it's a nice getaway to worship and learn good things absolutely of course like you have to go i would definitely recommend forest home i would definitely recommend forest home to my peers um one because you get to know people from this church more you're you're you sort of learn to be more vulnerable with your faith and with yourself, and it's just a really great experience. Spring break is over, and our men's and women's ministry are back. Men's ministry is in the family room Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. with the study Kingdom Discipleship from Pastor Teacher Tony Evans. If you'd like more information, please look to your program and contact our church office. Women's ministry starts back this week, Wednesday, April 10th, with a new study entitled Breathe by Priscilla Schreier. Books can be purchased for $20 in the lobby. Women's ministry meets in the family room at 9 o'clock on Wednesdays. For more information, reach out to Women's Ministry Director, Pam Lurkin. Families, we need each other. Let's take time to get to know each other better. You can do that on Sunday, April 21st, right after the 11 o'clock service during our family luncheon. That's right, where we will provide lunch, hot sandwiches, chips, cookies, so that we can all spend time getting to know each other. And don't miss out on the kids' ministry update. We had six kids saved at Easter Interactive Experience, and 157 people participated in the event. To God be the glory. Don't forget, we'll see you April 21st, right after the 11 o'clock service in the family room for lunch, fellowship, and kids ministry update. See you then. Thank you for loving Desert Springs Church through your tithes and offerings. We really appreciate your generous support. If you'd like to know more about Desert Springs Church or to give online, please go to www.visitdsc.org for everything else that's happening. All right. Well, I uh, hope you had a great Easter. We had a wonderful Easter here at the church, didn't we? And uh, what a great morning. Praise the Lord. God answered our prayers. The rain held off for sunrise service, if you were with us. And uh, the doves arrived in time for the dove release at the end of sunrise. And, and uh, what a great 8, 9, 30, and 11 o'clock service with our combined worship team, worship choir. It, it was just a great morning to celebrate that He's risen. And, um, you know, that's a celebration in our lives each and every day, isn't it? 
He's risen in our lives each and every day, and praise God for that. I want to remind you, ladies, Women's Study starts up again this Wednesday morning, 9 o'clock, but you get the best snacks if you come early. So that's a little tip from me to you. Women's Ministry, if you haven't been before, come on out. You're going to love it. And it starts this Wednesday morning uh, officially at 9 o'clock. And uh, we hope you'll come and enjoy that. Now, uh, this morning and through the whole month of April, we're going to be uh, looking at the brief book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. And uh, when I was in college, I remember my dad was preaching through the book of Jonah. I spent the first 10 minutes of the service trying to find the book of Jonah in my Bible. (laughs) I remember that finally I gave up and I looked in the table of contents because I thought I should be able to find it by now found the page number, turned in my Bible, and realized that page wasn't in my Bible. My college Bible had missed an entire book. The book of Jonah, part of Micah and part of Nahum, were completely gone from the binding. And uh, if you don't believe me, I'll bring my Bible onto the platform next Sunday. It's in my office. And uh, so, God willing, you have the book of Jonah in your Bible or on your app if you're using your phone or your tablet this morning. Uh, Jonah is all about learning to go God's way in life. I want to say that again. We'll spend four weeks, the entire month of April here. The book of Jonah is all about learning to go God's way in life. Now, uh, as you know, Jonah is the Bible's really big fish story. Four chapters that relate the true account of an unwilling prophet of God. And uh, many do not believe the content of this small yet significant book of Scripture. Uh, They say that a man being swallowed by a fish and spit on the shore, well, no way. Never mind the rest about God uh, planning to wipe out a major city and then changing his mind. You know, there was a little girl, and uh, she was telling her friends about Jonah being swallowed by a fish, and her teacher said, uh, excuse me, uh, little girl, that's just a fairy tale. A fish cannot swallow a man. And the girl answered, no, it's true. I'll see Jonah in heaven, and I'll ask him. And the teacher said, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And the girl said, then you ask him. (laughs) So, you know. I think the book of Jonah challenges us of whether we're going to really believe the Word of God or not. Why not? Is it any harder to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and God the Father raised Him from the dead? That's what we celebrated last week on Easter Sunday. And you know, Jesus spoke about the prophet Jonah uh, in His uh, Gospel accounts uh, here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and said that there would be a a similar resurrection in his life, like the rebirth of Jonah from the great fish, being three days in the tomb for the Lord before coming back to life. So Jesus affirmed the story of Jonah, and I don't know about you, but I believe it hook, line, and sinker. (laughs) All right. Well, if we were to actually investigate the thought and probability of a man being swallowed by a fish alive and then uh, coming back uh, three days later uh, being well, we know that Princeton Theological Review published the account that in 1891, a ship's crew was uh, uh, involved in whaling uh, there in the Mediterranean Ocean. And uh, one of the crew members was thrown off of the ship into the water and uh, disappeared uh, there in the foam while they were hunting a sperm whale. This was very close to the Falkland Islands. And um, uh, much later uh, that day, they were able to successfully harpoon a sperm whale, bring it onto the ship. And uh, of course, then you have to begin cutting the whale up. On the second day of cutting the whale up, on the ship, they found the missing sailor inside. And uh, he came out alive. French scientists studied this account and agreed that it was very possible due to the lower jaw of the uh, whale, the mouth and stomach size of the creature. Uh, Estimated temperatures inside of a sperm whale 
in that uh, part of the world would be 104 to 106 degrees. So it'd be like a nice spring day here in Coachella Valley. <laughs> but there would be plenty of air. Gastric juices would bleach the skin, but would not digest a living organism consistent with what happened there on the ship. Sperm whales, of course, are not typically found in the Mediterranean. However, they are known to swim great distances. Interestingly enough, other scientists who have looked into this account uh, relate that uh, a whale shark could have also been the likely specimen, and uh, men have been found alive in their stomachs, or a large sea bass called a Jew fish, which can reach 12 feet in length. I personally think, wouldn't that be funny if it was a Jew fish that swallowed the Jew? <laughs> now, let's bring it up to today, and in June, Specifically, June the 11th of 2021, the edition of the Cape Cod Times newspaper there on the East Coast had the feature story uh, telling about Michael Packard's account as a lobster diver who was swallowed alive. It says, quote, in something truly biblical, Packard was swallowed whole by a humpback whale. Packard recalled, quote, all of a sudden, I felt this huge shove, and the next thing I knew, it was completely black. Thankfully, he was later spit out by the whale unharmed. He continues to lobster dive today. And that, again, is a true fish story. So the Word of God can sometimes challenge us when we first read the content of its pages. And yet we read in Psalm 119, verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is inspired by God or God breathed. In 2 Peter chapter 1, men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So scripture tells us that God is active in our world and uh, why would he not be willing to use a fish to accomplish his purposes. The Bible tells us all creation brings glory to God. So every spiritual matter we read about within the pages of scripture requires trust, requires taking God at his word, uh, but it's a reasonable trust. So we wanna look at the book of Jonah together, a really big but a really true fish story. And today we're in Jonah chapter one, beginning in just the first five verses. Verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down and fallen fast asleep. Today as we enter the book of Jonah and the misfortunate adventures of a prophet of God gone south, we're talking about the subject of servanthood. We're talking about servanthood. Now, I remember I was still a young man when I didn't know what God wanted me to do with my life. And I prayed and I just said, Lord, do you want me to be a missionary? You want me to be an evangelist? What do you want me to be? I didn't know. And I remember God's presence overwhelmed me. And I sensed God speaking into my mind, will you be my servant? And I said, yes. Years and years later, I've come to realize it's the same instruction he speaks into the life of every believer. Will I, will you, will we be his servants? The call of God is to be his faithful servant. And somehow I think even as we begin chapter one here together this morning, 
In some unusual way, Jonah must have wanted God to be his servant rather than the other way around. Now, the good news is that when you love the Lord, when you seek to honor the Lord, God blesses you in life. He, he often answers your prayers. He heeds your requests. In fact, I believe that God so loves us, the only time he doesn't give us a yes is when he has a better plan. He has another purpose in mind, and we can trust him in that. But it doesn't change the fact that he's God and we're not. And listen to me, servanthood for God always involves the same ingredient. God desiring to use us to accomplish something beyond ourselves. God desiring to use us to accomplish something beyond ourselves. So we read of God's servant Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. And of course, Mary in Luke chapter 1, Behold, I am the bond servant of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to all that you have said. And then Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 3, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy strong hand. All right. Well, we're not here uh, for four weeks to condemn Jonah. We're not here to throw rocks in his direction or, or to tell him uh, how to get his life straightened out. Uh, rather, uh, like can often be done in our own lives, we want to learn from mistakes here. And uh, I think it's always appropriate when you're reading the book of Jonah to just ask yourself, what kind of servant to God am I being in my life? Well, uh, the first obvious point this morning we get out of the first five verses of the text is that Jonah was an ungodly servant. Jonah was an ungodly servant. And uh, remember this, lesson number one, just because someone is a prophet of God does not mean they're godly. And uh, how many of us have been wounded or disillusioned by a disobedient minister within our lives? We say, wait a minute, how come they did that? How come they're acting that way? What are they doing with that money? What's wrong in their marriage? And uh, what a sad thing that Jonah's disobedience was not threatening to only impact him, but many others as well. In this case, the fate of an entire nation. And uh, how we impact others around us is huge. Therefore, godliness is huge. It is the basis of our witness and our servanthood to Almighty God. Now, how do I know that Jonah was living an ungodly life? Well, first of all, he obviously lacked the heart and mind of God, having a love and a compassion for the lost. We read in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. And uh, when you hear that God wants you to warn people about coming judgment, you're supposed to take that to heart and have immediate concern because God is serious. Another way I know that he was an ungodly servant. Secondly, he was harboring sin in his heart, a hate and an unforgiveness toward the Assyrian people there in Nineveh specifically. Now you say, Mark, I don't find that in the first five verses. Don't worry, hang on. By the time we get to chapter four, there will be absolutely no doubt about it. And uh, uh, when uh, we, we read in Scripture, uh, in Luke chapter 6, that Jesus said, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. The Lord was serious. We are to return hate to others. Uh, the Bible says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we're the ones who love those who are unlovely and uh, care for those who treat us uh, shamefully. Thirdly, I believe Jonah had an inadequate fear of the Lord. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Now, Jonah's about to find out, as we'll see next week together, what happens when you don't have a healthy fear of the Lord. And uh, it's often been said, do you want to learn the easy way or do you want to learn the hard way? Jonah's going to learn the hard way. Now, secondly, I believe Jonah was a misguided servant, a misguided servant. And uh, there's the matter of being close to God so that you develop a love for others, so that you uh, develop a fear of the Lord, so that you turn hate in your life into a compassion and a concern for others. But secondly, I think Jonah believed his hate was justified, and that's misguided. In other words, we often rationalize our disobedience to God. We justify our cruel opinions. 1 John 1.8 says that if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and God's truth is not in us. And uh, I believe that Jonah felt that uh, he had a right to be uh, very hateful and vengeful of the Assyrians. Secondly, I think that Jonah thought he was in charge. I think he believed that he called the shots in his own life. And uh, that's evidenced by his rapid decision to go the opposite direction of what God wanted him to do. Notice Jonah didn't just stay and think about it. He took aggressive action against God's command. And uh, we know Scripture tells us we're to obey the Lord in our lives because He's in charge. That brings us to our takeout verse of the week. It's on a little card in the lobby for you. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said to them, Come, follow me. Come, follow me. You say, well, Mark, uh, I'm not sure God's uh, ever spoken in my life to go speak to this city or to go tell this people group to get their lives straightened out. You know what? The Lord's issued a command to us all, and it's there in Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me. And uh, when we pursue that, Lord, I will pursue you, I will follow you, uh, then we're not making the mistake of dear Jonah. And then thirdly, uh, I think that Jonah determined in a misguided way that somehow he could change God's plan for his life. He could make his own outcome. And so we read in Isaiah 25, 1, O Lord, thou hast worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. I want to tell you something. When God has a plan, you can't change it. When God says something will be, you and I, there's nothing we can do about it. Any thought to the contrary is grossly misguided. So following the Lord requires that we join His team. It demands our all. And I would uh, remind us today from these first five verses, don't get misguided. Understand that following God involves following Him, being willing to love, to forgive, and to extend as he leads us to. Now, thirdly today, Jonah was an unwilling servant, an unwilling. Notice how these things all go together. The ungodly individual is also a misguided. In, you ever meet someone who's misguided in life? Chances are they're living an ungodly life. And uh, then uh, Jonah was unwilling. And uh, this is often true as well. You speak into a person's life, hey, get with it. Do you realize what you're doing? And they're unwilling to even talk with you about it. Jonah had not surrendered himself to God and were to be fully submitted to him, entirely at his disposal. It was missionary Andrew Murray who said this, just as literally as Christ was given up entirely to God, I am given up entirely to Christ. And then in Colossians 1 we read, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. You know, if Jonah had heeded the word of God here in these first five verses today, I believe there would not be more than five verses in the book of Jonah. Many times, drama in our life comes because we're being dramatic with God. And uh, if you want to see more smooth seas in your life, go with God's plan rather than your own ideas and agenda.
Then in Luke chapter 22, Jesus prayed, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus was the perfect model of being an obedient servant to God the Father as a faithful son. So God will stretch us. He will challenge us. He will surprise us in what he calls us to in life. And all of it requires faith, a trust in God. Now, when you're God's servant, at times you will feel like you're living on the edge, doing things you never thought you would. Now, in all fairness to Jonah, we know that in the day of Jonah, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the book of Nahum gives us good detail that Nineveh was guilty of wicked plots against God, exploitation of the helpless, cruelty in war, idolatry, prostitution was rampant, and witchcraft was around every corner. So it was a very wicked culture in its day. No wonder the wickedness of Nineveh had reached God in heaven. And God always responds to evil and wrong. But Jonah wanted no part in its redemption. Jonah just wanted what Jonah wanted. And he would go to the other end of the earth to get what he wanted. And yet already, as we begin the book of Jonah, we find good news. First, as we read through these four chapters together, we'll find that God loved Jonah. God loved him. And God was patient with Jonah in his rebellious state, this rebellious, selfish child of God. And so, thank God he loves us, and he's patient with us. Can you think of some way God's been patient with you? Some situation you put yourself into or some response you made against God and God loved you and helped to correct you. And then God rescued Jonah. We're going to see that as God rescues Jonah from uh, the storm and the fate at sea. And uh, God wants to rescue us from our hate, our disobedience, our rebellion, our wrong. And uh, God didn't let Jonah stay in his sorry, sinful state. And I think God wants to build character in us. And at times, he will allow situations to enter our lives to build godly character. See, God's all about rescue. God is all about salvation. And then we're going to see that by the end of chapter 4, God used Jonah and if you've ever felt that you've lived rebelliously in your life, if you ever feel like, well, I don't know if there's any hope for me and God using me for his purposes, hey, take heart. Because even in Jonah's case, God used him. And it's encouraging to know that, isn't that? That God can use us greatly, no matter how much we kick and scream. God wants to cooperate with every one of his children, you and I, in accomplishing his kingdom purposes here on earth. And Jonah will ultimately accomplish a great feat for God, whether he liked it or not. And so God will use us. The goal of the book of Jonah is to cooperate with the Lord and don't learn the hard way. So fellow believer, as we begin the book of Jonah together today, be God's servant in a godly fashion. Allow him to change you as you draw near to him. Be a servant that allows God to guide you, live in obedience to him, and be a servant who stays surrendered, allowing God to stretch and use you. I think the most rewarding, fulfilling thing in all of this world is to be God's faithful servant. And God wants to use you, and God wants to use me. And so who's serving who? Be a loving servant for him. Would you bow with me? We'll pray. So Lord, that's what we long to be, your loving servants. God, this morning as we read about Jonah's annex, even from the first few verses of chapter 1, we think of ourselves and we admit that at times our opinions are off. At times our love for others is weak. At times, Lord, we just want what we want, 
and we ask your loving forgiveness. God, thank you for your patience and your care with each of us in our lives. Thank you that you're working within us to fully carry out all you desire to do. Help us, Lord, to get on board with that, to start rowing in your direction and give us willing hearts and minds and wills to do what you call us to. For, Lord, that will accomplish much for your kingdom. And so, Lord, today, afresh and anew, we commit ourselves to you. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And if you're with us today and you don't know you've ever invited Jesus to come in your life, you can do it right now. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And if you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead to give us a new life forever in heaven, then you can come to him and be willing to turn from your sin to receive him in your life. He'll come in, he'll forgive you of everything and help you to walk with him. If you need to do that, just talk to the Lord right now. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you're God's only son that you died for my sins on the cross and you rose from the dead so I can live with you forever in heaven. Please forgive me of everything and come in my life right now. I'm willing to turn from my old ways to live for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Would you stand with me? We'll have a closing blessing. You know, as we say every Sunday, if you have a prayer need in your life, just come forward at the end of service. We'd love to pray with you. Could be for a family member, a friend, uh, something going on in the community. We're here for you. And we have many members of our prayer team here in the front. Come on up. Keep them busy. And uh, we'd love to pray with you today. And uh, thank you for considering that important petition today in the lobby for uh, getting uh, good rights for our children out in the public areas. And then uh, we appreciate you today. God bless you as you live your life as a servant of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine on you. May God be generous to you, give you his strength, fill you with his peace, and use you as his servant. Amen.